Thank you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Oh, I would like to thank you all for joining this Smart EPC training online webinar in the name of all Smart EPC uh, project or consor uh, project team or consortium. Um, hopefully, in the next uh, two hours, we will uh, successfully present to you uh, what we have developed under this Smart EPC project and what we have tested throughout our pilot uh, projects. Uh, hopefully, this will be interesting and useful to you. <clears throat> uh, again, in, in front of Regea uh, Smart EPC project team or, or training team, uh, I'll be speaking. My name is uh, Josip Cengia. I'm an expert in EPC. I'm a construction engineer, but my professional background is in uh, preparing, in pre preparation, development, and management of alternative uh, procurement models, uh, which EPC is one of, and which we will talk about a bit more uh, later. So hopefully, if you're going to have any questions or experience, I can help you uh, with with some answers and and maybe pointers or with my uh, personal experience. Uh, Again, uh, so just to go briefly through uh, agenda once again, uh, so we're going to, first part of the training, we're going to talk about Smart EPC, what is it? Um, as I saw, only one of you is considered himself to be an expert in the EPC, so uh, it's going to be useful just to maybe have a short introduction into what an EPC is, what alternative procurement models are, how do they differ from traditional models before we enter uh, uh, explaining what a uh, smart EPC is as an upgrade to a standard EPC project. Mm -hmm. uh, then we'll try to present to you a smart EPC concept under which we have developed tools and documentation. So in the first part, we will just briefly go through the tools that we have developed uh, in, in smart EPC. And these tools are practically uh, the tools that will help you prepare your project, see whether they, they are feasible uh, for smart EPC uh, uh, model and whether you can go on uh, further in developing that project in this kind of way. Uh, we're going to wrap up the first part with Q&A, so feel free to ask me, uh, to ask us anything. Um, uh, as I said, uh, we have some experience, not some, I would say extensive. <laughs> I've been working for the last 20 years in this alternative procurement model, so I, I consider myself to know and to have some experience, and that can be quite useful. Uh, then we're going to have a break. In the second part, we plan to tell you a bit more about standardized contractual documentation. So. Uh, we would like to present you um, the other part of uh, deliverables of Smart EPC project, uh, which consists of the tender and uh, contract documentation, we, which we have standardized and made avail available on our websites, uh, which was told on the on the beginning of this webinar uh, that those all of those deliverables uh, you can uh, they are downloadable via link uh, that was sent with an um, uh, invitation to this webinar. We're going to show you a bit uh, about smart EPC cases uh, to be more concrete about a pilot project that was developed under this smart EPC project here in Croatia in the city of Karlovac. And again, we're going to wrap it up with Q's, Q and A's for this second part of, of our webinar. Uh, well, to start, uh, as I said, for introduction, it would be good maybe to just to uh, remind ourselves what is uh, what are traditional uh, models, what uh, and how do they differ from alternative procurement models? So traditional models for uh, uh, for investments in public infrastructure uh, practically uh, means uh, uh, that the authority is acting as an investor. And I would say that that is the main characteristic of uh, procuring uh, infrastructural project projects. Uh, traditional way. Uh, of course, this characteristic implies many other things. Uh, what does that imply? If authority is investor, that means he owns, owns, I would say, the project. So he would, uh, in development of the project, uh, uh, separately procure 
and contract the, the development of design project documentation. Then on the basis of design document documentation, he would uh, procure and contract the construction or, or reconstruction of the facility. Then afterwards, when the construction is finished, he would either procure maintenance or operation or he would do it uh, uh, with in-house capacity if he has any. And all of that would be financed either through budget or through or financed directly through bank loans, which would then be again paid by uh, by budget. So what of course, what does that mean? Uh, if the authority is in the center and if it acts uh, like a, a investor in the project, that means that most of the risks are uh, allocated to the authority. Construction company cannot be uh, blamed if the design project documentation is faulty. So, of course, when they begin their construction or reconstruction or modernization, any fault that will be maybe only recognizable during construction will mean additional costs to authority and authority will have to pay it when that when that time comes. Whether authority can remedy some some part of that cost uh, from design company uh, that that has uh, developed design documentation, that's a question to be answered uh, later on. But in most cases, in our experience, it never comes. So uh, for all of you that have have some experience in in, in procuring uh, uh, traditional uh, uh, public uh, infrastructure projects. Uh, in uh, using traditional way, I think that uh, most of you have had uh, such experiences where where uh, pr where faults from a previous phase of the project of development of the project uh, uh, was rectified later on and has implied uh, uh, new and additional costs to, to authority. So this is something that's. I would say widely used all over not just Europe but all, all all over the world. Why is that? Because it is uh, perceived to be a simpler and a faster way to realize uh, project uh, pro to realize public infrastructure projects. Why is that? Because we have learned how to procure design documentation. We have learned how to procure construction. We have learned how to procure maintenance, and how to get the finance in traditional way. We have yet uh, to learn and to gain experience how can this be done differently and maybe in a in a more smarter and more efficient way. <clears throat> Opposed to this traditional model, uh, there are alternative procurement models. Uh, so the main characteristic of, of alternative procurement models is uh, shown practically in this in this graphics in this picture on this slide. So the main difference is that here authority has one contract uh, to one uh, specific contractor, a service provider that's usually uh, be, uh, being organized in one special company called special purpose vehicle. So it's a special project company that's being uh, developed uh, just and purely to develop this project and to provide services to authority. Inside that company, there can be a consortium of design companies, construction companies, maintenance companies, or one of them can take the lead and uh, uh, contract the other ones into, into, into their, uh, uh, their project realization. Nevertheless, the main characteristic is that authority now doesn't have five or six separate contracts to manage its project. It has only one project, only one contract with clearly defined objectives. Of course, implications of that are numerous, but uh, first of all is that in alternative models, authority no longer acts as investor in the project. Now, in alternative procurement models, uh, the authority, and in our case, that would be municipality, city or county, uh, becomes a purchaser of goods or services, not an investor. That means, what does that imply? If you purchase a good or a service, you only pay for a good or service that has been delivered to you. So that's quite different uh, than being an investor where all the costs and you pay for all the, uh, the works 
or and all the equipment that has been brought into the project of course whether those equipment and works will result in the in the outcomes that you have planned that's a separate question so if you are an investor you are taking over the risks of developing your that of uh, development of your project that it will uh, at the end achieve the goals that you have started with <clears throat> so it all looks uh, uh, quite great it, it it looks much more simpler than traditional ways so why don't uh, we use it uh, more often why it's not used all around the eu uh, in 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 many cases well, the main reason I would say is that alternative models are still to perceived to be highly complex uh, and time consuming. And why is this uh, the reason? Well, of course, if you haven't had experience in developing or procuring this kind of project, then you have a fear of doing that. And of course, when you do something for the first time, it can seem it can be quite complex. It can seem complex. And of course, it will be quite time consuming until you have learned uh, uh, to go through the steps and if, uh, until you understand all the steps uh, and until you develop maybe internal procedures on how to develop and procure and lead and manage these types of projects. Um, as I said, the main characteristic of this alternative procurement models and why are there they thought to be in, in quite a lot of cases more efficient than traditional way is the shift of the allocation of project risks. Uh, since the authority is no longer the investor, but purchaser of goods and services, uh, he effectively allocates project risks, most of the project risks to private sector side. So these are maybe the biggest be benefits of alternative models. <clears throat> so when we talk about alternative models, uh, what are the maybe the most famous ones so we have here uh, mentioned the ones that uh, well i would say cover almost uh, every area and which are most famous and you probably heard uh, of all of them uh, so first would be power purchase agreements for uh, let's say energy plants these are quite uh, oftenly used uh, alternative models for uh, constructing an on-site energy facility and the characteristic of this power purchase agreements are that you practically give a building plot to a private sector company uh, or energy company to build an energy facility and you're paying only for the energy that has been produced by that facility uh, that means that all other project tricks regarding uh, cap, uh, financing capital investment, designing, constructing, maintaining and operating that plant is uh, allocated to private sector side. And you have practically agreed to what the price of the energy is per kilowatt hour, and you're paying for that for the next 10 to 15 years. So it's one case or one example of a alternative procurement model. The other procur uh, alternative procurement model is known uh, uh, as DBFMO, Design, Build, Finance, Maintain and Operate. And as the name says, you are practically procuring uh, four or five different processes in project development phase to one contractor, to one private sector company. Uh, these types of projects are also known as PPPs and are widely used for, let's say, building uh, public hospitals, uh, schools, tunnels, uh, highways. So the main characteristic of this uh, uh, alternative uh, procurement model is that uh, uh, that uh, public sector side pays to the private sector side only uh, if the facility is available and if the facility is performing to the agreed, uh, to agreed and contracted as standard. So what that, does that mean? It practically means to be plastic. Uh, if you don't use the building for that day, you will not pay it. If that building doesn't have a heating up to a standard that you have nominated and contracted and specified in the contract, you will not pay. So the building needs to perform up to the standard that you have specified and if it performs and if it's available in that sense then a private sector company gets paid so this is another type of alternative model and the third uh, uh, 
most used alternative model and most common alternative model is known as to be energy performance contract. And I think you're all familiar with this type of uh, contracts. And they are, in essence, I would like always like to uh, say that they're practically DBFMO types of contracts just for energy efficiency. That means uh, that you are paying to the private sector company if he delivers on energy savings as specified and guaranteed by the contract. So practically, it's similar to availability. They're not okay maintaining all of the building. They are providing and implementing energy efficiency measures. And if those energy efficiency measures result in energy savings that they have guaranteed, they are paid. In essence, <clears throat> all of these three types of contract we can uh, practically uh, uh, said that, say that the main characteristic of all of these types of contract is that they are uh, uh, performance-based contracts. So the public sector, uh, pu private sector side is paid based on the performance uh, uh, during the contract. If it doesn't perform, he is not paid. So these are the main characteristic of alternative models. So what about EPC and can it be used in public lightning? Uh, modernization of a street lightning system presents an energy efficiency project that is in most cases, uh, and I would say almost in 100% cases, suitable for EPC. Uh, for those of you that have uh, uh, some experience uh, with EPC and especially with EPC in buildings, you know all the problems that, that are developing and later on managing an EPC contract in buildings can have. Uh, opposed to that, developing EPC mo model in street lightning is less complex and much more less complex. Uh, and uh, it generally uh, represents the ideal first step, first step for the clients to learn and get familiar with the alternative models. So for those of you that have problem with maybe explaining or, or getting your uh, cities and municipalities uh, uh, engaged into, into developing and procuring EPC project, an EPC project in, in street lightning uh, can be an ideal, uh, ideal pilot project where they can learn, go through the process and maybe uh, get more confidence in, in, in EPC in general. Uh, so, what are the advantages of EPC in, in, in street lightning? Well, the, first of all, the operating regime is easily defined and less subject to changes. Uh, opposed to buildings where you have different types of users which can switch on or switch off uh, heating, cooling, or which can open the doors or open the windows, here um, uh, the regime of, of uh, the usage of public lightning infrastructure is uh, known in advance. So we practically know throughout the whole year when uh, public lightning, uh, street lightning is uh, turning on and when it turns off. So it's practically predefined and it's not subject to a change because there is no uh, use in, 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 in lighting up street lightning during the day. So we know uh, when the daylight is on and uh, when the night begins. So we know when street, light need, uh, street lightning needs to work. Uh, on the other hand, street lightning systems are, from technical point of view, uh, relatively simple systems. So you have, I would say, three main categories. You have luminaires, you have the poles on which they are uh, Im implemented or installed. Uh, you have the cables uh, and you have cabinets. So practically you have four points of, of infrastructure, four elements of an infrastructure. That is of course quite, quite less complex than a building where you have different um, uh, building systems, mechanical system, electrical systems, which all need to of course work together uh, for building uh, to perform to desired level. Here for street lightning system, it is quite easy or simple uh, uh, technic in technical point of view uh, infrastructure. What does that enable us? That enables us to clearly define uh, the points of responsibility of private sector versus the public sector. Whether it will be cabinets, poles, or luminaries, it is to be decided, but it is very easy to define which, which is the point where you draw that 
that uh, boundary. Uh, also, uh, one of the main reasons why uh, EPC in, in street lightning is uh, so, I would say, um, uh, cost effective is that because uh, uh, replacement of all luminaries with new ones, with so especially with sodium to lead, results in high energy savings, which then makes EPC project feasible in most cases. What does that mean? That means that uh, if you have uh, uh, energy savings uh, uh, high enough that you can repay your capital investments under uh, eight years, that means that you will have a feasible EPC uh, project. If you have uh, energy efficiency measures that need that uh, simple payback periods are 15 years and more, uh, that projects are can be quite uh, hard to uh, develop. Why? Because the financing issue in those types of project is quite hard to 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 solve. Uh, most banks tend to finance uh, these types of measures with a 10 to 15 year, uh, 15 years uh, financing loans. Anything longer than that is too long uh, and would be quite hard to finance. So in the cases of EPCs in buildings, if you have some uh, extensive measures that have uh, longer simple payback periods, you would often need some subsidies in order for that EPC project to be feasible. Here. In, in public lightning, that is not the case. Everything can be solely repaid out of energy savings. Um, another thing, uh, um, energy savings in, in street lightning are quite easy to monitor and control. Uh, so the energy consumption is quite easy to control. As we said, usage regimes are uh, familiar. Uh, you have practically uh, one bill to pay. Uh, you can easily track and monitor uh, how much energy is being used solely for street lightning. It is also easy to monitor whether luminaries are working or are in default. Of course, every night all the lamps go on and you can see if some lamp isn't working. Uh, of course, uh, why is this uh, important? Because you're going to have energy efficiency, you're going to have energy reductions if lamps are not working. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, we need energy savings, but we need uh, infrastructure to be functional. So in street lightning case, it's quite easy to see if some element isn't working. Um, what's quite important to say, and I think this will be uh, uh, reflected to the questions we have uh, prior to, to this webinar, and that's that um, additional savings in maintenance costs over the years can be used for upgrading other elements of street lighting systems and infrastructure. What does that mean? That means that when you look at, uh, at energy performance contracting, and if you're trying to develop an energy performance contract to be treated as off-balance sheet, so not to be counted on the books of public sector, uh, one of the requirements is that it is being solely repaid out of energy efficiency, uh, of energy savings. Uh, when we talk about energy savings, we are not talking about uh, uh, savings in maintenance and operation costs that also occur if ESCO company is managing that infrastructure for the 10 years. So th those are practically additional savings you can use to maybe upgrade some parts of the of the infrastructure or maybe implement some new and additional uh, services into your uh, street street lightning infrastructure. So here we go to smart EPC. What is it and what's the difference between EPC? Well, in essence, smart EPC is trying to answer uh, to the questions, can we combine uh, energy and non-energy services in energy performance contract to make it more attractive. So can we add some services to energy performance contracting services, energy efficiency services that we have standardly in EPC to make an EPC project uh, more attractive? A uh, smart EPC project uh, that is funded through Horizon 2020 program is trying to answer this and uh, we have been developing and working on this project for the last three years and in scope of the project, we have developed uh, Smart EPC concept, which consists out of development of Smart EPC tools and standardized project documentation. We have then uh, tried 
to test these uh, concept tools and to documentation through six pilots, two in Spain, two in Poland, one in France, one in Croatia, which we're going to show later on, in order to test uh, these uh, this, this concept tools and documentations and to see and to answer these questions that we have uh, that we have started with. So can we add additional services? Uh, so what does that mean, add additional services? We, we are trying under a single contract to uh, blend reconstruction and modernization of public lighting systems with other energy and non-energy services that use, in, in some way, use public lighting infrastructure, such as which are the services. We have identified services such as smart city applications, 5G communications, e-charging, uh, as the main services uh, that are available on the market today. When we talk about uh, those services, we can divide them between non-energy service and energy services. Of course, non-energy services would be smart city applications and 5G communications, because those services will use energy and uh, will not sell energy, will will sell uh, a service that has nothing to do with energy savings or energy consumption, so we call that services non-energy uh, uh, services. Additional to that, an e-charging service is, of course, an energy service. Uh, it's a service that is not uh, uh, resulting in energy savings, but in energy consumption. But it, it, nevertheless, it's a service that you can use uh, with public, public lightning infrastructure, that you can use public lightning infrastructure to provide to uh, to citizens um, in, in your municipality. So it's an energy service. Then again, the other way how you can split those additional services is uh, uh, if you look if they're, they are commercial or not. So we have split them into potentially commercial services and non-commercial services. Potentially commercial services would be e-charging and 5G concessions. Why? E-charging service, you can uh, you can practically charge end users for the consumption of the energy. So it's a service you provide to them. Uh, 5G concessions is uh, practically a uh, commercial service because you're providing concessions to uh, to uh, communication companies and they pay some fee for that concession. So it has a commercial basis. Uh, and then opposed to that, we have non-commercial services, which practically most of the smart city applications consist of. The smart city applications practically provide added public service. Uh, they enrich public services that are already uh, provided to the citizens. And they have, in most cases, uh, they don't have any uh, commercial basis to it. So it's an additional cost uh, that city or mun municipality will practically invest into providing a better public service. So, as I said earlier, uh, Smart EPC concept developed under Smart EPC project practically consists out of a set of tools and documents that will help cities prepare and procure Smart EPC projects. Uh, smart EPC tools practically consists out of uh, three different tools, action plan draft, Excel tool for calculating energy savings, and standardized template for detailed energy audits. While smart uh, EPC uh, standardized contract documentation consists out of tender documentation and contract documentation. Standardized, developed, and quite detailed, uh, prepared for cities and, uh, and facilitators to amend to their specific project needs. To help them to help uh, users or clients better understand these two uh, tools and, and standard documentation, we have also developed a smart EPC hand up, handbook. Handbook uh, practically can be used as a guideline on how to use those, uh, those tools and those standard documentation and to provide uh, a bit more clarity on how we have derived those those tools and how have uh, how we have derived those contract and tender documentation. We're going to see uh, later on what is all included in standard EPC uh, handbook, which is all available uh, at uh, Smart EPC uh, websites, which you can uh, practically have links to uh, following the Energy Citizen 
uh, web, web pages and which you have uh, had uh, the chance to go through. We uh, had the chance to see the link in, in, in um, introduction or to in invitation for this uh, online webinar. So this is what it looks like. Just a few graphics to show you the logic. Uh, we have developed fact sheets like a brochure just to get you familiar with smart EPC is and with few facts. Uh, behind it, uh, which then feeds into the handbook and handbook then uh, gives you links to uh, case studies uh, where you can see all of those uh, additional services, uh, non-energy and energy services and their implementation into the projects of street lightning infrastructure. Um, we have a market assessment report which gives you an insight into the market's potential and implementation challenges. And as the latest, we have ICT output specification, and that is practically technical requirements for implementation measures uh, for improving energy efficiency standards in uh, public lightning. So we have tried to give you extensive documentations to help you prepare your projects for procurement and later on development. So how to plan your uh, how to plan your smart EPC project. Um, practically, uh, we try to, to give you a guidance to prepare your EPC project based on standardized smart EPC concept. And that is what does uh, start the smart EPC concept consists of? Well, practically on standardized documentations, which are turnkey and off the shelf uh, uh, solutions where you can you can uh, have uh, uh, ready uh, detailed documentation which can be used easily adopted for turnkey solutions for practically additional services energy efficiency services uh, as well as non and uh, energy and non energy services uh, in this concept all of these projects should be self financed from energy savings of course you will test uh, this thesis when you have your project idea you will test the thesis with whether it can be self-financed through energy purely through energy savings or you or will you have additional maybe needs for financing integration with smart cities so we have tried to integrate smart city solutions into the public reconstruction and modernization of public lightning infrastructure and all of this is on the basis of uh, pay for performance schemes. That means that you pay only for the services that are delivered and in the scope and in the standards that they are delivered in. So this is what Smart EPC concept stands for. And we can try to develop it through these tools and standard documentation. This graphic is to show you uh, just the types of services that we have identified with when we were uh, looking at uh, the solutions and services that are practically uh, that can be found on the market. So we have an infrastructure for cellular communications. We have illuminar sensors for smart dimming. We have environmental sensors, water stations, help desk, help desk ads, uh, presence sensors, parking sensors. Uh, and so on. So all of these uh, services can be added to public lightning infrastructure, and most of them could be financed through energy efficiency measures. So uh, the answer to our question uh, from the start of the project was, can we combine? The answer is yes. Yes, we can combine, and in, in some cases, we can even finance most of these services through energy efficiency measures. So. To move on, how to plan your EPC project? Yeah. Uh, Sorry. Maybe if we can ask uh, our participants uh, if they want to see, maybe we can showcase uh, fact sheets of or handbook if somebody has an additional question right now. Uh, if you have already studied it or you have particular interest in some part, uh, this is the good time maybe to interrupt and jump in uh, with uh, so far presented materials such okay. as fact sheets or handbook. Uh, whether somebody of you want to see something get inside, we can open it directly online. Yeah, if someone has any questions Maybe regarding can, this, yes. this part we, we have uh, presented so far. 
I'm not seeing in the chat. Milka, I would need your help. Uh, yes, me neither. Maybe we can come back to this later. Yeah. If we will be ahead of time, uh, we are here to maybe comment some of our uh, deliverables we have created uh, and uh, maybe first present them also. Yeah, we can come back to this later. We're going to have a Q&A session in 10 yeah. minutes time, uh, so hopefully we can maybe discuss on that uh, further on. Uh, we have also a few questions uh, that we got before the webinar, so we will get back to that during our first Q&A session. So hopefully okay. that this will this will start uh, discussion. Um, to go on, uh, so how to plan your smart EPC project, how to start. Uh, to help uh, cities and facilitators uh, start preparing their smart EPC project, of course, uh, we have developed smart EPC uh, tools, concept tools. Uh, these tools uh, are designed to help you see uh, whether your project idea, your initial project idea is feasible or not, or whether you have all the data or not, and whether that that is a project that you will get your su uh, support from municipality uh, and will you then turn it into a real uh, project so to uh, get you started first would be standardized methodology uh, standardized methodology is the methodology for collecting all necessary data about the public lightning system needed to perform technical and financial analysis of course to start to see uh, and test the feasibility of your project idea, you would need to have data. Um, to see whether it is financially viable, technically viable, you would need uh, quite detailed uh, data uh, uh, that's being done. In most cases, it's it's being known as energy, energy audits, but we have made uh, a standardized methodology, a quite detailed, I would say, methodology for conducting a more detailed energy audit uh, for collecting all of that data needed to see whether additional services can be implemented or not uh, and what are the energy savings that can be produced if you are to enter an EPC project or a, or a project of modernization of public lighting infrastructure. So first step would of course be as, uh, to provide you uh, to uh, conduct an energy audit using this methodology uh, uh, for standard standardized methodology for collecting all of this data. Uh, as I said, standardized methodology prescribes minimum levels of detailed data that needs to be collected. Uh, this will result in, of course, uh, standardized data, which will then help not just you as a client uh, to uh, analyze uh, the data and see whether it is financially or technically uh, feasible, but also for the ESCO companies to see and prepare their bids. If they get uh, different sets of data from five different cities, then every time they need to see whether everything is collected, they need to uh, do a due diligence on that uh, before they can make technical and, and financial uh, tender or offer. So by doing standardized uh, energy audits, we are saving their time and of course, that always means money. More standardized, more detailed data means fewer risks, fewer uncertainty, uncertainties, which then result in uh, better offers, lower offers uh, with less risks involved. The second uh, tool that we have developed is analytical tool for data analysis. Well, this tool is practically an um, uh, Excel table that will help clients uh, to easily analyze feasibility of your project. So it's an Excel table that will practically, when you enter the data collected through energy audits, will help you see the potential for energy savings. Why is that important? Because energy savings will then define potential for capital expenditure. Uh, of course, uh, if energy savings are high enough and if you got a feasibility of a project or if simple payback periods for pure reconstruction of uh, street lighting infrastructures are from five to six years, then there is potential in adding some non-commercial services, 
that means something similar to smart city applications of so those services that have no commercial potential but are can bring added uh, value to your project then you would have additional uh, space for including or implementing those services and included that capital expenditure into your project later on i will uh, explain what does that mean for uh, off and on balance sheet treatment uh, but no matter uh, the, whatever the case uh, would be, uh, you would have, uh, of course, uh, uh, place in your budget to repay those uh, additional capital expenditures if if you have enough of energy savings. Um, what is, uh, it is also important to say that energy savings will vary not just depending on the you know, changing of the source of the luminaires, so lead to sodium or something else, but also to the management of public lighting systems, so including uh, dimming regimes, whether predefined or automatically uh, dimming uh, regimes or automatic, uh, automatic dimming uh, services, uh, can add additional energy savings to your, uh, to your initial uh, calculation. So have that in mind, these additional services can boost your energy savings uh, for 20 percent for additional 20 or 30 percent um, calculating or summing up to a total of even 70 percent of uh, 70 and even more percent of initial energy savings and for the last uh, concept smart epc concept tool or we have to present or we have developed uh, action plan draft it's just a draft uh, 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 practically a word-based word -based document that helps you structure your, uh, I would say, uh, a plan, uh, ex ex uh, project execution plan in, in, in one document. Why, it, uh, why is it important when uh, an action plan practically uh, describes what you plan to do, what is the goal, what is the purpose of you entering this project, what are the goals you are trying to achieve. Uh, it then um, uh, helps uh, uh, present to city officials or, or even uh, citizens, it is in most cases a uh, public document, why you have uh, chosen to go alternative procurement model, uh, why is that the optim optimal financial model for realization of your project? So you practically, uh, I would say, uh, rep represent how have you uh, come to the decision to uh, go along and go uh, forward with this project execution. Uh, in our case, it's quite useful to have uh, action plan. It's quite useful to make this document to go to city councils and to gain wider political uh, will for project because uh, then uh, it is uh, uh, there is less chance that your project will be terminated if there is there are some changes in 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 city city uh, uh, political city uh, officials uh, if there is change in in policy of of the city so in essence uh, to gain a wider political will is of importance in these types of projects because you're dealing with public infrastructure, because these projects are quite visible to, to citizens. And since they are visible, they, they're quite uh, often uh, very interesting for citizens and, and, of course, the political party that's leading the city at that moment. Um, that's that uh, regarding the first part of of, of this presentation and webinar. Uh, hopefully you understood and I have uh, successfully uh, introduced uh, what uh, Smart EPC is and what are the concept tools uh, that we have developed under Smart EPC project. Uh, as I said earlier, you can all, they can all be find via link that you have, that you can uh, find uh, in the invitation to this webinar. Uh, and I would open a Q&A session before the break. Do we have some we new questions? We have some questions already. Uh, question first, how to synchronize production and consumption without power sharing, but in island mode? Uh, yeah, I think that 
that's a question maybe uh, for PPA types of project, not an EPC or for EPC in buildings. Uh, take her as production and consumption without power sharing. Well, that's a question that that's quite, uh, I would say, uh, quite uh, often we can find when dealing with PPA projects of uh, installing solar power plants, PV modules on rooftops. Uh, the answer is uh, if you have a, a, a management software, management software, energy management software, or a, and if you are in a position that you can practically manage your production of the facility that it doesn't influence your function functionality, then you can maybe uh, synchronize production and, and consumption. But in other cases, in most of the cases, you're going to use battery or it's some some kind of storage systems uh, if you are to 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 practically uh, synchronize those 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 two lines and be in island mode and not use uh, the grid connection for for managing uh, or storing energy. So as I said, this is maybe uh, more for the PPA types of projects, but um, hopefully uh, I, I have answered your question. It is quite hard to synchronize those two, those two uh, lines, production and consumption, and it's not uh, uh, always possible. Second question, proper understanding of the EPC. Does EPC mean that all ESC remuneration is to come from savings generated by the project? Yes, that's what EPC uh, stipulate, uh, stands for. Uh, but to be honest, that is only in case you want to have your EPC treated as an off-balance sheet, so uh, not be treated as the debt for public sector client, but rather as cost, as a... a uh, cost item on your budget budget uh, plans. If if uh, EPC cannot be paid out of energy savings, that doesn't mean that you cannot uh, contract it. You can contract it, but the remuneration paid, the EPC fee paid to the service provider would will be bigger than the savings he produces. You can also do that, but in that case, your project will be on balance for your public sector client. So. There are no uh, rules on on whether you can do EPC or not, and I would uh, strongly advertise that you always use EPC, no matter if it can be repaid uh, out of energy savings or not, because, as we said earlier, EPC is in in general a performance based contracts, and I always advocate that you would try to procure and try to uh contract services uh on performance based uh on performance basis so if the service is not delivered do not pay for it yes uh one of our participants shared his experience that the, the answer in question two in poland is no okay uh, so we have yeah question three the impact on epc on public debts, can the debt uh, provided by the banks be fully protected or must it be deductible from the EPC's remuneration like all other remuneration components? It must be deductible. So uh, there are various ways how banks can protect themselves. They can give a debt uh, which can be let's say let's say protected in a way that you practically uh, use guarantees provided by escom companies so uh, if you have a payment reduction to made to escom companies you do not uh, reduct the debt the part of the the epc fee that is used to service the debt but you directly uh, remunerate uh, the fee from escom company there are some cases like that uh, the documentation that we have developed does not uh, use that that model. We have used the model. Uh, we have uh, gone from the facts that uh, Escom company is the financiers, and we we as a public sector client have nothing to do with uh, with banks. So banks finances uh, not public sector client, but an Escom company. And if Escom company, if there is a fee reduction. 
uh, so great that it will go into the depth of the that's being given by the bank to the ESCO company, then ESCO company have has to guarantee for that uh, by other means. So there is no direct link in our standardized documents. Uh, there's no direct link between the bank or financiers and and public sector client. Okay, we have a, um, let's say, start of discussion in, uh, let's say, uh, area of Poland, uh, which is really interesting because we, we have two Polish uh, cities as pilots uh, here in our project. Uh, feel free maybe to join the discussion. You can uh, ask the question without um, just typing. Uh, may maybe we can discuss this uh, based on uh, your experience in Poland. Uh, what um, feel free to maybe share your experience uh, as I can see uh, you have uh, experience with such projects so maybe to share which uh, <clears throat> barriers uh, you have met. Yes. Just a, a comment for the, this question too. In Poland we have Energy Efficiency Act and it regulates uh, considering risks and uh, the scheme for payment between uh, EP, ESCO company and public and this is connected with uh, what is EPC, what uh, could be uh, the debt uh, and so on. So it's not so uh, so simple, but uh, this is maybe this is a specific regulation in, in Poland. So that oh. works like that. Yeah, uh, we we are aware of that uh, and our colleagues from Poland are practically commenting on that and this will be uh, something that we will uh, reflect on in our final uh, documents since this project is still uh, ongoing uh, and in during our final reports and the, the documents that we will amend, we will reflect on that to see how this standardized document that we have developed can be changed and how it fits into national legislations. Uh, in my sen in sense, in my point of view, uh, most of the documentation can be used. Uh, in Croatia, we also have an energy efficiency, I would say, sub-regulations. Uh, so uh, it's it's not a law, but it's uh, yeah regulating documents <clears throat> that say how you can provide uh, uh, EPC contracts in public ser in public services in uh, in public sector clients but um, it leaves you with enough room to have standardized other types of documents it just says what are the minimal requirements that the contract ne needs to have and what types of uh, things you need to have defined in your contract in order for it to mm -hmm. be uh, defined as energy performance contract. But what I would like to also stress out, uh, and sorry if I'm, I'm if you have a thought to share with us, is that a lot of countries and uh, Croatia is one of them, tried to define energy performance contracting and try to made, uh, make uh, national regulations on energy performance contracting and use that to to uh, report on public debt. Uh, so uh, to say if it's done by this legislation, then it's not a public debt. And that can be used for national context. But when you go to Eurostat, Eurostat is quite strict. It doesn't look whether you record it as national debt or not. It has a strict and standard set of rules. And if you do not imply it, uh, then it will be recorded as an on balance no matter what your ministry says on it. And it has uh, been um, a, a stumbling stone for very, uh, very long time in EU. And I know that uh, even Abe has uh, been included in developing guidelines on how to, uh, let's say, treat or not treat, how to uh, see whether your EPC project will be um, treated as an off or on balance sheet uh, regarding uh, Eurostat, uh, Eurostat's point of view. So yeah, that's. I just wanted to say, no matter what uh, national legislation says, Eurostat is independent in looking whether something is on or off balance sheet treatment. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. I wanted to to add something. Uh, sorry, because my camera is not working. 
Uh, but my name is Rafał Czeszlak and I am also from Poland. That, uh, uh, of course, that what you said, Joseph, is, uh, is true, because uh, the, the, there is a gap between uh, what happens in Polish national accounts or elsewhere uh, and what uh, the Eurostat recognizes. Uh, but because there is not, uh, you know, not so many uh, EPC or PPPs, uh, so uh, in practice, really, uh, <laughs> I am aware that nobody cares about it yet. I mean, uh, so, uh, but the problem is with the uh, uh, bankability of the projects. So, for instance, in Poland, uh, if you don't guarantee the uh, repaying of the uh, financial costs, uh, the, you know, no banks will uh, be interested in projects. Uh, so, uh, well, we have advised on over 25 successful PPPs and EPCs, so, uh, and the problem stays. Uh, only if you've got, uh, say, a specialized investment funds uh, or other, you know, private uh, financing, uh, you can uh, really assure the, the risks in this uh, model way, but know uh, where, uh, if the banks are uh, present. So that's uh, quite, uh, you know, sad, uh, but sad but true. Yeah, I would I, agree. I would... I would like to add something concerning standardized documents. Uh, maybe you know that in Poland we have uh, EPC guide issued by Ministry of Climate and Environment and there are standardized, standardized documents and EPC contracts preparation and so on and so on. So, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's just for Poland, of course, specific for our country regulations and so on. So it was issued this year on. Yes. Yeah. Last year. last year. In yeah. fact, it was issued last year because together with Marek, we are authors of these guidelines. So uh, it was a really, you know, challenging thing to um, include Eurostat uh, view <laughs> on uh, our reality. But but we did as much as we could, and uh, I hope the effect is uh, satisfactory. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I I uh, I am fully aware of the situation that in 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 Poland since we have Polish partners. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, so Warszawa and but, but, sorry. Uh, Warszawa and Krakow are are partners in uh, smart EPCs, so we are aware of those guidelines as they were also used when we were drafting and making our documentation more standardized. So first we had the, let's say um, a great version of standardized documentation. And after those guidelines uh, have uh, stepped into force, we had to make the second version, let's say, uh, because uh, new barriers arise. So, yes, we are fully aware of that. Yeah, and I just wanted to, to add uh, uh, this problem that you were mentioning on financing uh, EPC projects was uh, even bigger than before for the last six or seven years because uh, 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 financing uh, for the public sector clients was at, at the lowest levels. Yeah. So if we had inflation and we had budgets that are going that are going stronger and stronger, you have bigger, in, uh, in, how can I say, incomes in the budget and the uh, interest rates were at their uh, history minimums. Uh, for for financing, it was quite hard to find 100% uh, uh, private financing, and of course, it's always cheaper to lend uh, money to finance the money if it's being guaranteed by public budget than if it's a pure uh, project finance, which in essence uh, smart EPC PPPs should be. It should be pure project financing with non-recourse, where only recourse should be a facility that's being reconstructed. In our case, in ideal case, uh, uh, ESCO company should be, uh, I would say, a company with experience and with, with some leverage, so uh, it could provide guarantees to the banks uh, uh, that the project will be delivered in, in scope that is contracted. And that's, of course, theoretically, uh, such uh, so and and in but in practice, as you said, it it, it was quite hard to to 
to get the financing for the project uh, to be not feasible, but to be maybe um, uh, competitive to public financing. Because if you get loans that are 3% of interest uh, higher than what you could get uh, when you take the public loans, then all the efficiency that you would gain through through better uh, for better procurement of the project or less capital or uh, costs or less maintenance costs would be lost due to higher finance costing. So yeah. Yeah, sure. We are we are uh, waiting for the case study from Krakow. Maybe, so maybe we could discuss it later because uh, again uh, we've been advising on this big uh, Krakowian uh, street lighting project now, uh, and uh, I have just agreed the. <laughs> the text of the uh, EPC contract with the bank that uh, that that will finance it in practice because of the uh, some preferential issues and uh, uh, and of course the the project the contract is now bankable but it uh, will go into public debt in uh, the meaning of Eurostat of course not in nas our national meaning yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, just uh, to give you a heads up, uh, while we present case studies, we'll only present uh, in short uh, Karlovac uh, and uh, our special this uh, Poland pilot cases we are preparing for for the later on se seminars. Ah, okay. because Yeah, okay. yeah. We, we, we have been uh, uh, waiting uh, for information on that due to the facts that you have mentioned that you had new energy acts and we know that these are the reasons why these projects were a bit late uh, opposed to st initial initial plans because uh, as I am aware uh, Krakow and Warsaw should have been already contracted and procured uh, one year ago I think uh, were Krakow, our initial plans. No no K Krakow is ahead of the uh, schedule and okay. Warsaw is not doing EPC so yeah. uh, well Maybe we can discuss it, you know, like later yeah. or something. Yeah. Later. Uh, so, yeah, we have we have gone through our initial plan. Maybe just to um, uh, remind the participants that we have one and one session. So maybe we can propose Polish session, let's say, with our own partners. <laughs> yeah, and I would be. Uh, we can. Uh, we are available for joint uh, meeting on Polish. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, Region or and especially we can comment on Krakow because I know Krakow uh, went uh, or or thought of going uh, PPP way than EPC way. So I know that there was some thinking about how how uh, would no what we would we do it uh, in an EPC way only. But uh, but yeah. it's another story. So we can meet and discuss the yeah. the problem some other time. Yeah, right. thank you. Great. So, Christian, if you uh, agree, <laughs> I'm going to take the lead since we have uh, gone over the time, maybe to have a 10 minute break um, before we start uh, part two of the session. And we're going to have 10 minutes time for Q&A's after part two, of course. That's great we... indeed. Uh, it was important not to cut the conversation that was created by by the participants and you so let's meet uh, you can please all, to all of all of you stay connected do not leave this meeting and we we meet uh, here at 20 past uh, three to yep. for the second part okay thanks see you see you in 10 minutes
Hello everyone. It's 20 past three. And uh, if you are ready, we could start again for our second part of the presentation. Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Hopefully everybody is here. Just a second. OK, uh, so to start for in the first part of the webinar, uh, we have presented to you uh, smart EPC concept uh, tools that we have developed. Those tools are to be used uh, to prepare and to uh, maybe uh, do the initial analysis and initial screening of feasibility of your smart EPC project idea. Of course, the project doesn't uh, stop there and it's not the end of preparation. Uh, your project idea that you have developed and initially tested in your offices, I would say, uh, need to be tested and validated on market. Uh, in that sense, to test your project idea to see whether it is feasible or not, really, you need to procure the project. You need to go into public procurement. Uh, in order to help cities um, and municipalities and, of course, facilitators uh, prepare that project documentation, uh, under Smart EPC project, we have developed uh, standardized contractual documentation. Uh, what does that standard, uh, standard uh, contractual documentations include? It includes standard Smart EPC contract documentation and standard EPC tender documentations. Later on, we're going to reflect on what does that mean. Um, contract documentation is a contract on its own. It's a draft of a smart EPC contract, while tender documentation is made more in lines uh, of a guidance document where, where you, you, are, uh, you can use that documentation to see uh, what uh, we recommend uh, to be used in 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 prescribing tender documentation. This is decided due to the fact that uh, different uh, different uh, countries in EU have different. I would say, even though we we should have all similar public procurement acts, or it should be compatible, uh, maybe some uh, documentations and procedures are different. So we have made this document in in form of guidance. To start off with contract documentation, uh, so under this project we have developed a, a, an extensive and detailed uh, standard contract documentation in order to be easily tailored to client requirements and, and needs. And what does that mean? We have uh, used more is more <laughs> approach. That means we have tried to define everything that we can uh, think of that in our experience uh, has proven to be uh, to be needed uh, or or useful. Uh, so uh, the document itself is quite extensive. It has like fifty to sixty pages. So it, it, it's quite detailed. Uh, but in in our opinion, in this way, it's more easily tailored to national uh, to specific national legislations. And it's more easily, you can more easily cut off the parts that you think you don't need it, uh, rather than uh, trying to include and add uh, different clauses to it. So uh, this type of contract documentation can be easily uh, adapted and amended to, uh, ne to needs of the project, specific project and national legislation uh, framework. Of course, when you go to procurement uh, procedure before you go to the pro procurement procedure, it is recommended that you do, I would say, uh, like a pre-step uh, uh, market consultation uh, in such a way that you prepare your project uh, documentation in form of contract documentation and tendering documentation, and you test it on the market prior to official starting of public procurement process. This is due to the fact when you officially start public procurement uh, procedure, uh, then you have uh, procedures and, and ways of communications that are strictly defined by Public Procurement Act. And in some cases, it might be hard to uh, communicate in such way with, with uh, potential ESCO companies and potential tenders. So uh, in our case, and this has been our experience, and we highly recommend it, 
we always uh, uh, try to send uh, this contract documentation that we have prepared and tender documentation that we have prepared to all potential ESCO companies that, that we see on our market uh, uh, in order to get their feedbacks prior to official starting of public procurement. Uh, in, uh, also, uh, we have sent those public uh, 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 smart EPC contracts to financiers to local banks to see uh, what are their uh, views on that, whether they are ready to finance these types of projects or not. Uh, again, from our experience, uh, that proved to be quite, oh, sorry, that proved to be quite useful because uh, then we could have uh, meetings with banks, uh, official meetings uh, with banks where we uh, get to set with their uh, risks department and uh, argue on uh, whether some uh, s some things are needed in project or not. And I must say, in my, most cases, uh, when when we discuss on that, uh, it has led to to them uh, understanding that that some of the guarantees that they expect and uh, maybe in standard projects uh, are required. Uh, that they don't need it here. So, yeah, it is quite hard to prepare a smart EPC project. There's a lot of communications, uh, communication included with various stakeholders, but this is, I would say, a must-have step, uh, must must do step, if you are to have a, a, a successful EPC project. So any any conclusions whether to adapt or amend uh, contract documentations uh, are to be uh, drawn uh, after stakeholder workshops and market consultations. And that is our uh, warmest uh, uh, recommendation that you do that. Um, in general, the concept how we saw our standard uh, smart EPC uh, contract uh, it is structured in in such a way that there are three types of investments under one contract. So we have a standard EPC. So that's an investment in energy savings due to modernization of public lighting systems. So that is investment of energy efficiency measures. The second type of investments are investments in energy or non-energy non-commercial services. Uh, such uh, services would be for instance, uh, smart city services. So you have a service of, let's say, sensors or video surveillance that will uh, have no commercial uh, feasibility and which needs to be repaid uh, from a uh, public budget. So we have split that up into different, uh, as a different type of investment. And the third type of investment is the investments in energy or non-energy commercial services. What does that mean? Those services are practically defined as a right uh, to ESCO company to use public sector infrastructure to provide a commercial service to end users and to get revenues from that. Uh, we have under our contract defined various ways how you can, uh, as a public sector, be paid for that. You can be paid as uh, uh, a fee for the right that you have given, like a concession, or as a share of revenue. But in a sense of public debt, and this is something we talk to, uh, these types of investment, and these are three types of investments, they are different and they should be treated differently. So you're gonna have one contract that maybe a part of the investment can be treated as being off balance sheet, the other part being balance sheet, and then the third part being also off balance sheet because it is practically concession based investment. So yeah, it is. It seems quite complicated, uh, and it is quite complicated. But at the end, as I said, if you do it, uh, 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 if you define, if it's all specified and clearly, uh, you can divide these three types of investment. Then you can report on them differently. Um, as I said, this approach was decided due to the fact that different types of investment will have different accounting treat treatments, and what's also quite important to stress out that management of the public lighting system is in our case in case of standardized contract documentation completely left uh, to authority or the city 
why I'm stressing this out? Because this is a question that we was quite oftenly asked. Uh, we were quite oftenly asked about that, that how can we uh, manage and oversee uh, ESCO company, uh, uh, how will ESCO company manage um, uh, a streetlight uh, infrastructure? Because if we give them, um, if, the, if we give them power to manage street lightning uh, infrastructure, and if they need to provide energy efficiency services, everybody says, and which, which is logical, that ESCO company will then dim the lights to the lowest, and of course use uh, all of uh, all of possibilities to to make this this uh, energy savings be as high as they can be. Well, to not lower the functionality of street lightning infrastructure and to obtain the standard minimum to what authority needs, we have left the management of the public lightning system when it goes on, when it goes off, and will it be dimmed, and how much it will be dimmed to local authority. Now, having said so, uh, there is a question on how can we define then energy savings. Well, energy saving, we have linked energy savings with monitoring of active powers of components. So practically in, in, in this case, in this standard EPC contract, ESCO company guarantees for the per performance of the luminaires that it will use uh, guaranteed amount of power to produce guaranteed amount of luminaire. And according to Eurostat, if we have defined the standards, uh, then the uh, energy savings that are derived from that can be used to, uh, to, to practically prove that investment is uh, financed uh, out of those savings. Um, Having said all that, what would be the next step or what would be the step in defining uh, project documentation? Well, first step would always be define the project scope. So we said um, at the beginning, you have standard smart EPC tools uh, that you can use uh, to test the financial feasibility of your project. So use the analytical tool to see whether your project will include all of the infrastructure or some part of the of the cities or municipalities infrastructure. Uh, you will have various uh, reasons why to include or not to include some parts of infrastructure. For example, maybe in parts of infrastructure, you have already changed uh, some luminaires, maybe not to LED, but to some new energy efficient equipment uh, that it might not be feasible to change it or one or two years after it to lead, it will not result in such energy efficiency measures that uh, energy efficiency savings that will be uh, enough for you to repay your uh, capital expenses. So maybe that parts of the project will not enter your project scope. The other thing you need to define is uh, what uh, services you will procure. So will you have only energy efficiency services? with uh, monitoring of uh, every luminaire, with softwares for managing and operating your public service, uh, public lightning service. Uh, will you have e-chargers? Will you have some additional uh, smart city applications? Uh, this is something to decide, of course, upfront. Then you need to decide also the point of responsibility between the client and service provider. You remember from the start of this webinar, I said that uh, street lightning infrastructure is quite uh, simple uh, opposed to buildings because it has practically four distinctive elements of that infrastructure and you can quite easily define which point separates a responsibility of the public sector opposed to, to uh, private sector. So you can define that to be a cabinet, and then the private sector will change all the cables from the cabinet to luminaries. You can say the poles are included. You can say poles are excluded. Poles stay on public side, but cables and the luminaries will be on the private side. Or you can say only the luminaries are included in the EPC project. Uh, whatever the case is, uh, you will uh, do your calculations. You will see how much of the infrastructure you can include into EPC project for private sector to private sector client ESCO company to rectify uh, uh, opposed to the 
energy savings you're gonna you're gonna have. So uh, the energy savings will uh, practically dictate on how much of the energy uh, street lighting infrastructure you can change. So that will be uh, step first. When we have decided on all of these questions, uh, the other thing, uh, the other part of the project, uh, smart EPC contract documentation that you're going to use are technical requirements. It's an annex to, to, to smart EPC uh, contract, standard dra draft contract, where it practically uh, defines uh, not technical requirements, but technical restraints regarding the services. So we said that alternative procurement models are different than traditional way of procuring. In traditional way of procuring, you will do uh, design documentation, you will develop design documentation, and that design documentation will specify all technical inputs to the projects. When you do smart EPC, you are procuring your project based on energy audits. So private sector or ESCO company will do uh, development of uh, uh, detailed uh, project design or made project design, and it will define technical technical inputs. But what you need to do in this alternative procurement model is to define project outputs. So you do not define, you define uh, what you need, what are the results, what do you expect? You do not define how to achieve that. How to achieve that is the question that ESCO company needs to answer. And this is the way how innovative technologies uh, and techniques are introduced into these alternative procurement models because five different tenders can have five different waves in, uh, on achieving uh, the outputs that you have defined. And uh, quite often public sector clients uh, were wrong uh, thinking that they knew better than market which is the most optimal and most cost effective way to achieve the, the outputs they needed. By this way you practically get market based uh, and market tested uh, answer to your question which is the most effective way for your outputs to be achieved. And at the end, you as a client, you practically you you want to achieve the outputs, and you want to achieve it for the at uh, the most efficient way for the lowest cost, and that's what you practically uh, get out of procuring projects this way. Define minimal uh, technical uh, requirements, of course. So define the restraints in 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 technical sense. For example, define if you have some softwares define uh, minimal requirements that software has to be compatible to other software. So uh, ESCO company can know if it uses different software, what is needed for that software to communicate with already existing software, define what are the cables that are already there, what are the cabinets that are already there. So in sense, define uh, uh, restraints or define the, the base point uh, of which uh, the ESCO company will then practically develop uh, their own solutions. Uh, also, what is important, uh, not to forget that, you need to define how you will monitor progress and fulfillment of the contract. So you need to have uh, clearly, uh, you need to clearly state how you will progress, how you will monitor progress, how you will test if the if your outputs are have been achieved uh, in order to avoid doubtful situations where you can raise doubt and you can have maybe disputes between you and the ESCO companies wh on whether they have fulfilled their key outputs or not. Um, after that, uh, you can go back to the standard standardized uh, draft documentation, the, the, the main project, uh, the main text of the of the contract, and there you define uh, your uh, deadlines per project phases. So uh, our recommendation always is that you do not uh, be too strict with deadlines because uh, opposed to traditional way of procurement here in alternative procurement uh, models, you do not pay anything until the project is uh, in, until the project is fully finished. So if you have too strict deadlines, then uh, uh, ESCO company can be in problems uh, with with financiers 
because if financiers uh, think that this is too strict and that they cannot achieve those deadlines or uh, they give you, uh, they uh, accept those deadlines, but uh, practically uh, give penalties to the ESCO company. If they don't reach those deadlines, you can find yourself uh, in, in problems. Uh, so have in mind that in this case, the investor is ESCO company. It, uh, the deadlines needs to be rational and reasonable and that they are not paid until they provide service. So you have no project costs, they invest everything and the first money or the first income they see is when they deliver the project. So be rational, be reasonable in defining project deadlines. Do not uh, shorten them too much because you will make project to be too risky to finance. Define risk allocation, of course. Uh, be aware that uh, when you go to market consultations, uh, you will find yourself in situation that ESCO company would, and financing uh, institutions will often try to shift some of the risks back to you uh, in discreetly this uh, or or in such in such way that maybe you do not notice uh, upfront, but every change in, in risk profile of the project uh, means that it can be uh, report, uh, recorded uh, from off balance sheet to on balance sheet. So any, any changes of standard EPCs documents that we have developed in such a way can make uh, your project uh, go from off balance sheet treatment to on balance sheet treatment so be quite quite careful when you do that define the rights and obligations of each party of course that's something that's that's normal in every contract uh, try to be as more detailed as you can be uh, but try to have in mind that this contract is something that's being written for 10 to 15 years and every contract that is so long it's similar to to marriage <laughs> It needs to be flexible enough because it, if it's too stiff, it will uh, end up in a disaster. So have that in mind. Uh, think about all, all the problems that can rise uh, throughout the project implementation and try to, to write obligations in such a way that they are clearly defined who is obligated to do something. But uh, if when when talking about penalties for not doing something try to to be reasonable uh, we have uh, done initial uh, definition of these rights and obligations throughout uh, sm our smart epc contract documentation i think they're quite detailed but if you see that there's some additional things you need to define uh, you can add that to standard uh, contract clauses um, define payment mechanisms uh, also quite quite important, uh, payment mechanisms practically relate to the way uh, how you pay your EPC fees. So they are linked between uh, paying the fees and delivering uh, services to agreed standard. So if agreed standard is, if the service is not delivered to agreed standard, penalties uh, must imply. So uh, payment uh, mechanisms are practically functions or formulas that uh, that tell you uh, uh, how much of a penalty you will uh, you will imply on on on, pri on on ESCO company if the service is not delivered. In case of energy efficiency services, that's quite clear. Minimum of of penalty should be uh, the cost of energy. Uh, of energy of extra energy used by street lightning infrastructure uh, uh, used above guaranteed minimum defined by the contract. So if you used 100 gigawatt hours before and you entered an EPC contract where EPC uh, partner told you you were going to use 20 gigawatt hours uh, and then through monitoring, you see that you have used 21 gigawatt hours, then the penalty should be one gigawatt hour uh, multiplied by the cost of the energy in that moment. That should be a penalty for uh, ESCO company. 
this is in case of, of course, energy performance contracting and energy performance measures. But for the other investments, you have the right to define penalties as any way you you decide uh, that's useful. Also, what I like to stress out is that uh, uh, every contract needs to clearly define situations that that lead to contract de determinate uh, termination. So breach of the contract and uh, the way how you calculate termination fee. This is the thing that that raises most of the disputes between contractual parties, and this is where most of the contracts go to some kind of litigation. So try to be as clear as you can be on how you ca calculate a determination fee in case um, public sector client is, is guilty of contract termination or in case of ESCO company being guilty of termination or in case of, of uh, force majeure. Nevertheless, if you have this clearly defined, you will save yourself a lot of uh, money and problems later on if, if things go uh, bad and if your contract needs to be terminated. Uh, how do we calculate uh, contract termination? And to, to, in order to do that, uh, it's useful to have value of investment. It's not just useful, it's practically mandatory. And uh, under this uh, smart EPC contract documentation, we have developed a table that's called value of investment. It's practically uh, Excel sheet that uh, that defines or specifies uh, uh, project costs during the project lifetime. So we have project costs in the in the project reconstruction phase, and you have project costs during the usage phase. All of these costs must be uh, nominated by the tenderer, by the ESCO company in the tendering process, and must be defined in the years that they happen. And out of those costs, uh, they must calculate the fee. So the fee must be clearly a result of the costs that are nominated in the in, uh, in the value of the investment sheet. Uh, what does this uh, bring? Uh, what benefit uh, it brings us? Well, if you have that, then you can practically quite easily uh, define and calculate the termination fee. Uh, in this value of investment, we have financing costs also, as well as a cost uh, of uh, private equity. So practically that would be not the income, but the profit that is expected by the ESCO company. So if the contract is terminated for uh, due to the fault of public sector client, you will know what is the lost revenue or lost profit that, that you need to calculate in your termination fee. And in this way, it is proven to be case in, in, in some of our experience, uh, this really uh, kind of opens eyes to public sector clients as well as to, to private sector clients on what will happen and what to expect if contract comes to termination. And in our cases, uh, in many ways, uh, in many situations, uh, contract sides have tried to amend uh, the things that led to a situation where the contract could be terminated in order to stay the contract alive, because at the end, if contract is terminated, everybody loses. So it's always good to have this um, clearly uh, and uh, quite easily calculated. How investment value looks like, it's a cost, as I said, is practically cost specification, but it's not traditional cost specification because we do not uh, we do not define uh, works or, uh, by measure of, we do not quantify works by, let's say, working hours, but we just have cost categories. So, for example, we have de de designing approval and permits costs, and we have just the cost categories, and we have like a turnkey solution. So we have expense for that whole item. Uh, this is due to the fact that we, in Smart EPC, practically contract turnkey solution. There is no uh, more or less works included in these types of contract. So this is just uh, an example few pictures on how this value of, of um, investment looks like. And as you can see, uh, out of those value of investment, 
practically total fee and annual fee and monthly fee is calculated. And you can see financing costs are separately uh, shown. Uh, so you have finance costs uh, from third parties and finance, uh, financing costs of own funds. That is, of course, the interest or the profit the Desco company is expecting on its own investment. Uh, moving on, after standard contract documentation, we have uh, uh, a draft of tender documentation. As I said earlier, tender documentation is drafted more in lines of guide guidance uh, guidelines, uh, just to uh, give you a pointers on what what to be aware of when you uh, prescribe your procurement documentation according to your Pu public procurement act and what to be aware of when prescribing minimal technical uh, capabilities of, of uh, for tenderers and potential ESCO companies. So always be aware, and this is something I would like to stress out in, in this part, is that you are looking for investor and service provider. You're not looking for contractor. And this is a, a mistake quite often made by a lot of cities and municipalities are our clients when they are trying to tender uh, on an ESCO company and they're searching for practically a contractor that will replace the luminaires or they are searching for the company that produces luminaires. We are not searching neither one of those. We are searching for a service provider that is investor who will invest in to development of this uh, reconstruction and who will provide us with energy service. So have this in mind when prescribing minimal capabilities, uh, capability requirements for your potential tenderers. Always tender on the basis of minimal fees. Always uh, try to, uh, we say, simulate uh, uh, tendering process on your own. Uh, always define what is the expected fee uh, calculated uh, to know what to expect when you go into tender. Do not tender, and we have saw this quite often, that people tender, that say, you, uh, we tender ESCO company just uh, looking for some ESCO company to, to reconstruct and, uh, and modernize our street lightning uh, system in in accordance with not in accordance but that fee does not uh, succeed uh, energy savings that might not always be the case in some cases you might have uh, expected fees much lower than expected energy cost savings so uh, do not tender on on such basis because uh, in in uh, in such cases it might not be not useful you're giving too much of a space to esco companies to to have too much of a profit if i'm if i'm free to say so always tender on what is the expected uh, smart epc or epc fee that you're expecting on and which you have calculated on your own and of course uh, for uh, but for the last give enough time for public procurement process be there need time to prepare good bits uh, to move on to, to case studies, uh, and I have taken a bit more time uh, for this. Uh, so we have prepared, uh, and you can find uh, case studies, and I think we have, yeah, we have put that in, in, in uh, chat. You can find the link to our case studies. Thanks, Irene. Um, uh, today, we will just present you, uh, in short, uh, one of our pilot projects that is uh, being uh, developed in the city of Karlovac. So, City of Carlos reconstructed its uh, street lightning infrastructure, and we're gonna show you a bit uh, a short video about it and give you a few general general uh, informations on the reconstruction later on. So hopefully you can hear anything from the city on four rivers. Originally built as a fortress, it is known today for its green parks, rich history and beer industry tradition. Numerous music and cultural events take place in Karlovac, such as the Beer Days, which attract visitors from all over Croatia and the region. 
to make the city even more recognizable and support exciting nightlife, it was decided to modernize its existing public lighting system. The city of Karlovac has joined the European project Smart EPC, which aims to test a new generation of energy performance contracts that incorporate smart energy services in addition to the reconstruction itself. Smart EPC enables the reconstruction of the public lighting system along with the development of advanced communication networks, the construction of electric vehicle charging stations and other so-called smart city technical solutions. At the beginning of 2023, the city of Karlovac contracted an EPC project with a contractor committing to design, finance and reconstruct approximately 9,000 lamps. The contractor will only be compensated for the energy savings realized during the 10-year contract. Software 2 also monitors the execution of the contracted energy performance service, the achievement of guaranteed energy savings, as well as the functionality of the luminaries. In addition to the public lighting system, the contractor was granted the right to build electric vehicle charging stations, thereby securing an additional source of income and motivating him to offer more favorable lighting services. If you are looking for more details on energy performance contracts in public lighting reconstruction, or how Smart EPC can help your city or municipality, please visit our web page. Well, hopefully this was interesting to you. We are quite uh, proud of this of this uh, pilot project. Uh, of course, we have tried and tested uh, um, a smart EPC concept uh, in city of Karlovac. So practically standard project documentation was tested as well as concept tools. And as you saw, some of the non-energy and energy uh, services were also tested. In conclusion, uh, so just a few facts on what has been done in city of Karlovac. You have seen the the, the video. Uh, we have replaced uh, somewhere around 9,000 uh, luminaires. Uh, this is not a uh, whole of the of the city of Karlovac public lighting infrastructure, but it is most of it. Uh, monitoring and management of every luminary was included. What does that mean? That means that every luminary is communicating with a central management system. Uh, so you can practically switch on and switch off every every luminary. You can uh, monitor uh, its energy consumption and you can see whether it works or not, whether it is functional or not. So everything is seen on this uh, via this software, which is included into the service. Uh, communications and center management system included, as I said, uh, that includes also software that practically uh, calculates on its own uh, EPC fee. What does that mean? That means that a uh, city can uh, say that a uh, luminary is malfunctioning and it will report that uh, throughout the system. And if it, uh, a luminary is not uh, rectified or changed in specified time, then automatically penalty is being uh, calculated for uh, ESCO company. So practically this system is 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 giving a calculation of the EPC fee in, in real time and automatically. Public lighting cabinets were uh, reallocated and reconstructed. Uh, sensor ready luminaires are implemented. So even though smart applications are not implemented at this at this moment, uh, city wanted to have uh, luminaires that are practically uh, sensor ready. And that's what uh, uh, ISCO company has implemented. And possibility for implementation of integrated e-charging uh, points on predefined poles. Uh, just to be clear, you saw this um, e-charging point in the video, and this is just to illustrate uh, the possibility that ESCO company has. So it is not uh, uh, being implemented yet, but we have um, uh, given a possibility that during the project lifetime, this can be 
uh, it's a service that can be uh, provided by ESCO company to the to the citizen. Uh, just a small uh, info on the numbers. Uh, estimated capex for this was three million euros. Uh, OPEX was around 0 0.8 million euros, and as expected, annual savings in electricity costs were around 760,000 euros. For all of that, uh, City has uh, City has get got the offer from the ESCO company uh, for EPC fee of 677,000 euros. So as you can see, fees significantly lower than expected energy savings. And additional to those elect electric energy savings that the city will have, you must uh, add, we must add maintenance and operation uh, savings that, that will round up uh, this annual savings to almost 900, uh, to almost 900,000 euros. So there's a quite a lot of, I would say, meat for, for city to use those additional uh, savings uh, to rectify and modernize uh, other parts of uh, street lighting service, or to, of course, implement uh, smart city applications. As I said, what we learned, e-charging service, uh, uh, we wanted, of course, to test it. We wanted to see, uh, we see we see this service as being commercially viable in, in near future, and we wanted to test this, but at this moment, it has been shown that, that uh, market conditions are such that this day it is questionable whether that e-charging service would bring any additional revenue. So uh, in order not to present too much of a risk, we have defined that service provider can in next 10 years have the ability or right to implement these e-charging services if they and when they become uh, viable. So it's, it's a right, not an obligation. And if that right is to be uh, used by a service provider, then a revenue sharing uh, model has been defined in the contract uh, instead of the fixed price for the for that right uh, for that right to be paid by ESCO company. So uh, this is our example. This is uh, what we learned uh, in developing and testing this pilot project. Hopefully, this will be useful to you. Uh, as I said, the, there are numerous possibilities, and we think that these possibilities and services will become commercially viable in the next few years, even though at this moment uh, uh, they have proven not to be additional, I would say, additional uh, benefits in, in revenue sense to the project. Nevertheless, uh, all of these services can be included into standard EPC contract documentation. Uh, I have uh, come to an end. Uh, I just would like to welcome you all to see all of these uh, deliverables. You can all download them from uh, this uh, Smart EPC website, which you can find on Energy Cities um, sites. Uh, you can download all of these standard concept and standard uh, contract documentation. Um, as well as, of course, contact all of us uh, that are working as, as partners in, in uh, Smart EPC Consortium. As Mr. Rafal is interested in our uh, best practice example, uh, he was wondering how do we share extra savings in this project, then he's still typing some kind of question, but you can, um, if you don't have time to type it, you can uh, yeah. ask directly. Since, uh, as you saw, uh, since we got a good fee, uh, and this is something that also uh, Eurostat guidance says, uh, extra savings can be shared in such a way that a minimum proportion should, could go to the city, while the majority of extra uh, extra performance should uh, go to the ESCO company. That's what Eurostat says, yeah. and that's quite logical in sense that uh, in order to, for it to have economic benefits and to be treated as an economically investment of the ESCO company, that needs to be defined in such a way. Well, we defined it uh, in such a way that practically every extra saving can go to ESCO company, and this is because uh, extra uh, because savings are monitored on the level of lamps, not on the level of uh, real extra savings. Since the city 
uh, is uh, managing and operating the street light infrastructure so he can dim the lights on its own he can uh, switch off lights and and turn off and turn on lights those savings will be borne by the city but if equipment produces or performs better than it is guaranteed by the esco company and produces extra savings all of these extra savings in 100 percent will be will go to the esco company Thank so in you that very sense much. yeah okay Okay, that, that's what I wanted to hear. Thanks a lot and many thanks for the very, very informative webinar. It's a great job. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thanks for staying five, more, for five additional minutes to the meeting. I hope it was uh, clarifying as well with this, this last question that we had. The, if there are no more questions, then I would, uh, I would uh, close the, the meeting, the registration, and thank you all for, for your attendance. Thank you all once again. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all. Have a good thank afternoon. You. Yes. Bye -bye. Have a good evening.